One of my least favorite words in the English language is humanism. Not because I disagree with it or anything, but when someone mentions humanism or says that they're a humanist, I have no idea what definition they mean. There's so many different ways to use that word, but this video may take the cake as the most unusual version of humanism. In the seventh lecture in William James's Pragmatism series, he examines a philosophy of humanism that states that human influences shape our truth. It has nothing to do with human value or being pro-human like some Attack on Titan stuff. It's rather an epistemological humanism, or a human-centered theory of knowledge. With that said, let's check out this idea and how it relates to James's overall philosophy of pragmatism. Welcome back. It has been a while since our last pragmatism lecture video, but today we're staying in the realm of James's theory of truth. Now let me make something clear that I probably should have also said in my last video on truth. The pragmatist theory of truth, or more specifically James's theory of truth, can be seen as a separate analysis from looking at an idea's practical effect. James has this theory of truth that we could use to look at ideas, but we could also separately judge an idea based on its pragmatic value. Like me personally, I don't fully agree with James's idea of truth, but what I love about pragmatism is that emphasis on practicality. With that being said, let's look at this weird use of humanism that James is talking about. He cites the philosopher F.C.S. Schiller for this new humanism. Mr. Schiller proposes the name of humanism for the doctrine that, to an unascertainable extent, our truths are man-made products too. Human motives sharpen all our questions. Human satisfactions lurk in all our answers. All our formulas have a human twist. When people are in a debate, or maybe more likely an argument, they often present their points as the facts, or the truth, or the reality of the situation. Schiller's humanism doesn't say that reality isn't a part of it, but human biases are also in that blender. Our truths are not reality, but our beliefs about reality. Reality is in general what truths have to take account of. This implies that there is this independent reality, but what exactly is it? James decides to break it down into three elements. The first part is what he calls the flux of our sensations. When we look at a tree, we sense the tree with our eyes and view the tree as a part of reality. The tree is there. However, we can only really see the tree from one angle. We can't see the individual molecules that make up the tree. We can't see the tree fully age and die before our eyes. We are sensing the tree, but we are still forced to view it from a certain lens that doesn't let us fully grasp it. The second part of reality is made up of relations between our sensations. This is like looking at the tree in autumn and connecting the dots of time and appearance. Seeing the tree in this time relates to the orange colored leaves. The third part of reality is made up of previous truths that we have taken into account. So we're looking at this tree in the woods, but then we see a bear in the distance. Truths of the past tell us that grizzly bears can really screw you up. So we take that into account for our next belief. This part is talked about a little in our last lecture video, so check that out. Now with these three elements of reality, James says that we as humans still involve ourselves with human motivations. That they are is undoubtedly beyond our control, but which we attend to, note, and make emphatic in our conclusions depends on our own interests, and according as we lay the emphasis here or there, quite different formulations of truth result. James gives the example of Waterloo, that famous battle where the English beat the French. He says that even if the facts are the same for both, the English will look at Waterloo as a symbol of victory, while the French will look at it as a symbol of defeat. Same facts, but different perceptions. What we say about reality thus depends on the perspective into which we throw it. The that of it is its own, but the what depends on the which, and the which depends on us. So reality seems like this thing we can't really grasp in itself. I always describe it like a smoothie. You can't drink pure reality. You have to put it in a blender and add in your own human motives. The two get blended up and then you can drink it. When we talk of reality independent of human thinking, then it seems a thing very hard to find. Now James has a number of supporting arguments in favor of Schiller's humanism and I think he does it best with this shape. Let's say this represents reality, but what is it that you see? What does your humanity turn this thing into? Do you see a star? Do you see two triangles overlapping? Do you see a hexagon with triangles around it? Or maybe you just see the triangles connecting all around. Maybe you see the Star of David. This video is actually coming out during a time of sorrow and conflict in Israel and Palestine, so maybe when you see this shape you're reminded about current events, and it instills some emotion in you. 
The point, however, is that our humanity will always be a part of our beliefs about reality. It's kind of a humbling thought. Again, when we get heated in a debate, we like to believe that we have reality or the truth on our side. But if you accept this humanist position, you realize that you just have a belief grounded in reality. Reality is still definitely a part of that belief, and beliefs vary in terms of their accordance with reality, but it's not a perfect representation of reality either. You see how naturally one comes to the humanist principle. You can't weed out the human contribution. Now there is a bit more to this essay, but I think this is a good stopping point, because I really want to get into the next lecture, which is about pragmatism and religion. I hope to make future videos about different religious ideas that can be meaningful to our lives, and I think this next lecture will create a good foundation for those sets of videos. But yeah, philosophy has ideas and theories about life, but so does religion, so why not explore that field of study as well? If you're excited about those videos, then subscribe for more philosophy and religion content. Also be sure to hit the bell and like this video. Comment below your thoughts on this lecture, and I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.